Impressionism and post-impressionism took place largely in France in the latter half of the 19th century. In part, impressionism was a reaction against neoclassicism. After 60 years, this movement seemed as if it was too restrained and too academic. On the other hand, it was also a reaction against Romanticism. Although they appreciated the bold experimentation with color, Romanticism seemed too concerned with an inner world and an inner sense of emotional response. Instead, the Impressionists wanted to record what the eye saw when it opened upon the external world. To me, Impressionism is part of that exciting um, movement of the 19th century, which I tend to call the pursuit of realism. It started with people uh, like Courbet and the Barbizon School, came through Manet, and of course saw the end of the what was the Renaissance, that is the whole business of looking at the world through a frame with the illusion given by perspective. I also say it is something which was linking in with the exciting experiments being done and inquiries being done into optics and into colour. And those two things coming together meant the contemporary and the ordinary, the realist uh, approach, was fused with uh, the whole business of what does the eye actually see in terms of colour and form. Impressionism was an art movement in France which started around the 1860s in Paris and was a revolt against the um, academic art that was put out by the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and exhibited in the Salon. The, this group of young painters um, didn't get exhibited in the Salon so they eventually in the 70s in fact began exhibiting their own work and what their work was about was everyday life in Paris about modernity and also they used a different technique from the standard salon artists which was much freer and much more colourful and because they had access to the new technology, the new paint in fact, much brighter colours. Indeed the salon was virtually the only route to artistic success at the time. Art submitted to the Salon that failed to match the conservative tastes of the juries would simply not be selected for display. And repeated rejection could mean failure for the artist unprepared to create Salon-friendly images. In 1863, the Salon overplayed its hand. No less than 60% of the artworks submitted that year were rejected and an outcry followed amongst artists and critics. Aware of this, the Emperor, Napoleon III, decided that the rejected works should be displayed separately at a special salon, a salon of the rejected, called the Salon des Refusés. It was a popular idea, but one of the paintings displayed at this one-off event caused an outrage a work by an artist who would profoundly influence the painters who would soon change Western art forever. His name was Edward Manet, and his controversial painting was called Le Déjeuner sur l'Herbe. In this painting, Manet rather shocked contemporary critics by mixing genres of paintings. Look at it this way. What he's done is taken a typical Giorgione old master painting a fête champêtre, or a luncheon on the grass. And into that, he's mixed a realist sensibility of two gentlemen dressed who've joined the picnic. This shock of two different styles together makes the classical nude seem suddenly to be naked. The female nude seems to be completely out of place at first glance in the picture although Manet had many deliberate reasons for including this female nude. 
he was in a way satirising the tradition of placing the female nude in the pastoral idyll. She stood for an idea that was working class. She stood for the type of woman that was beyond the bounds of acceptable behaviour, maybe a prostitute even. The effect of this is to strip the mythology out of painting, to take away from the old master sensibility some of its sense of mystery and magic. His use of broad brush strokes of bright, fresh color, his seeming disregard for the rigors of line drawing, and his strong contrasting of light and shade were too much for those raised in the rigid classical tradition. The Dejeuner Soleur was roundly condemned, but Manet's views on color, light, and brushwork would prove popular with a number of younger artists, then struggling for salon acceptance. It would be these artists that would create the style that we know today as Impressionism. Artists like Pizarro, Berta Morissette, Degas, Renoir, and perhaps the greatest of them all, Monet. Claude Monet has become regarded as the archetypal Impressionist painter. Born in 1840 and brought up at Le Havre in Normandy, Monet's artistic talent shone early and he began to receive commissions for his work at the age of just 15. But the young artist rejected the formal art training that was then available to him in Paris, finding his own views at odds with the traditional principles being taught. Monet decided to join the studio of Swiss-born Charles Glair, a successful salon painter who remembered his own financial difficulties as a student artist and offered models and his studio to artists for a very small fee. Glair's benevolence attracted a large array of artists of all ages and abilities. Indeed, it was here that Monet became friendly with painters like Pizarro and Renoir, and it was here that the seeds of Impressionism were sown. Monet soon became preoccupied with the effects of light on the subjects that he painted. Monet would refuse to paint even the leaves in the background unless the lighting conditions were exactly right for him. He would also often travel with his fellow artists to the forest of Fontainebleau near Paris to paint nature au plein air, in the open air, attempting to replace the subdued and dark shadows of their predecessors' work with open spaces and sunlight. He was concerned with the impression of sunlight on nature. He was concerned with the effects of light and the way in which light changes very rapidly throughout the day. And the way he achieved this and this rapid change was through his use of paint and his use of brush stroke. Maybe even more so than someone like Manet, he was almost obsessed with showing that he had been working on the canvas and almost the only way he could achieve the effects which he saw in light and the only way he could express his new interest in science and the new way people were understanding how colours worked was to show lots of rapid brush strokes and a very new approach to the use of colour which was more concerned with fleeting impressions than a finished process. The consequent lack of finish in Monet's paintings enraged the critics, who saw it as the result of nothing but laziness. But despite repeated periods of near starvation, Monet maintained his artistic approach. In 1870, Monet was forced to leave France to avoid involvement in the Franco-Prussian War. He moved to London, and as we shall see, he was joined by other Impressionists as well. Monet also studied the work of the English landscape artists like J. M. W. Turner and John Constable, the pioneer of modern open-air landscape painting. The French artist was impressed, but with the end of the war, Paris would again become the hub for Monet and his contemporaries, whose work would soon receive a full public display for the first time. Tired of repeated salon rejections, the artists who would become known as the Impressionists 
decided to present their own exhibition in the unlikely surroundings of a photographer's studio on the Boulevard du Capuchin. On the 15th of April, 1874, the world received its first view of Impressionist art. On display were works by Monet, Renoir, Degas, and Pizarro, amongst others, including Manet, who, although never a full-blown Impressionist, was close to all the others who would be labeled as such. After the exhibition, he worked closely with Renoir and Monet, even painting Monet at work in his studio boat. But in April 1874, the critics were utterly dismissive of the art they produced. Those critics who did visit turned up simply to mock and pour scorn. One of Monet's works, entitled Impressionist Sunrise, led one amazed critic to mock the group as Impressionists a derisory label, but one which the group came to accept for themselves. Criticism of the harshest kind would continue, though, during subsequent Impressionist exhibitions. This is a late Monet painting, done in the south of France in 1888. It's one of a series of ten paintings, and it was normal for Monet, in fact, to paint the same scene many times at different times of the day. Even in his later years, Monet fought an uphill battle with the critics. He was even offered the Legion of Honor, the highest prize that could be given to a painter in France, and he refused it. It was also in this year that one major critic remarked upon its excessive bravura, its brilliant vulgarity, and yet another critic, upon seeing this painting, simply remarked, this is Monet's finest hour. Despite these strong oppositions, the Impressionists continued to experiment with their new ideas. Monet and others were looking to record an instantaneous impression of what they saw in front of them, often working quickly in a sketch-like manner which blurs the visual field. This approach increasingly emphasized the appearance of the brush strokes and the effects of light and color. The desire to see differing effects of light on a subject at different times of the day often prompted the artists to paint a scene many times. Monet painted 40 pictures of Rouen Cathedral, all from the same angle, but at different times of the day, thus showing the passage of time by the movement of the light over an identical form. His fascination with the effects of light, above all other factors, can be seen in his depiction of a Paris railway station, the Gare Saint-Lazare, painted in 1877. The Gare Saint-Lazare of 77, quite a small painting, you'll notice, is one of many that he painted in this station. It's possible that he moved back into Paris, in fact, from the suburbs because he was so interested in what was going on in this station. So there are many studies and there's another big painting as well. But this particular one is an amazing painting because he's worked the surface so hard and he's used these small strokes and there is a jewel-like texture of the surface and the colours are beautiful and predominantly blue. And when you stand at the right distance from the painting, you really get a sense of what it was like, I imagine, to be there. He was not all that well liked. He was refused by the salon and therefore he didn't have a reputation, but he persuaded the station master there that he was a, a very well-known and famous academic painter, salon painter, and uh, the station master was very pleased and he said yes, he could come and paint and he would get the steam up in the trains. And he did about 12 paintings, very different, all from different views, uh, in which the steam, the light, was the thing which was actually what he saw, not the girders, the particular engine the particular people. He was excited by the fact that it was contemporary technology, just as Turner had been with rain, steam and speed earlier. And he was excited by how the eye actually saw colour, rather than how we were told to see colour. He's trying to set down what the eye sees and not what the intellect tells him to see. Monet's enthusiasm for painting unidealized outdoor scenes, as they appeared to the artist's eye, was shared by one of his friends and colleagues, 
Camille Pizarro. A contributor to the first Impressionist exhibition of 1874, and to every one that followed, Pizarro's Impressionist approach developed through his associations with Monet and others. Camille Pizarro was a major member of the Impressionist movement. We have here a painting of the city of Rouen and its bridge. Notice in particular the way in which he's shown the setting sun with the warm light reflecting on the water. And yet, unlike Constable, he hasn't added black to his yellow in order to create the shading color. Instead, he's added the complement of yellow, violet. This creates a much stronger sense of form in his paintings. And yet, nevertheless, he's flattened out his paintings yet again by leaving an extremely visible brush stroke. It's as if he's discovered the secret to deep illusions of space and yet reminded us that it's a painting by leaving his brush strokes visible on the surface. Like Monet, Pizarro sought to record his visual impression of the scene at a particular moment in time. To capture the vibrating quality of light, Pizarro, like many of his fellow impressionists, chose to use short, choppy brush strokes. Again, the critics reacted strongly, disdainfully suggesting that impressionist painters fired paint onto their canvases with pistols. To be fair to the critics, it must have been difficult to come to terms with this defiantly new avant-garde art. By 1897, late in Pizarro's career, a painting such as Le Boulevard des Italiens was much more widely understood. By then, the practice of standing back from a painting such as this to let the impression of the whole canvas coalesce had become established, a significant advance in the appreciation of Impressionist art. Another painter essential to the Impressionist movement was Monet's great friend Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Renoir is perhaps the best loved of all the Impressionists for his subject matter, light-hearted scenes from real life, pretty children, adults at leisure, flowers and beautiful nudes all of which have an instant appeal and directly communicate the joy he must have taken in painting them. Renoir's paintings almost demand to be looked at from a distance because developments in the science of optics at this time, new understanding regarding how the eye sees things, enabled the Impressionists to translate these developments into their paintings so Renoir wanted to show that maybe one of the ways that people take in images is to look at them from a long way away, which allows them to get a swift overview of what they can see in front of them. In a painting such as The First Outing, he varies his use of brushstroke. Some areas which he perceives to be perhaps more in the background, he uses a thinner use of paint, he uses softer brush strokes, whereas on features that he really wants to highlight, he picks out with a heavier use of paint and a stronger brush stroke. But Renoir was very interested in making his brush strokes obvious. And in a way, the mythology regarding his nervous personality could maybe be seen in his almost nervous use of the brush on the canvas. As with Monet, critics felt that Renoir's painting was simply too sketchy, too unfinished, with a lack of detail that annoyed their traditional tastes. Although Renoir executed a number of landscapes, his speciality was the study of the human figure, often within a group scene. One utterly compelling example of this was painted in 1881, the luncheon of the boating party. The viewer acts almost as an observer of the scene, a scene full of casual, non-posed figures. The subjects in Renoir's pictures appear quite unaware of the presence of an observer, and unlike with the stage-set feel of much traditional art, with a painting such as this, the viewer feels almost a direct part of the action. Renoir was a true great of the depiction of groups of people, creating vivid scenes with a medley of colors and an uncanny ability to show how sunlight played upon the subject. 
A wonderful example of his skill can be seen today at the Louvre. His 1876 Moulin de la Galette, a work utterly at the heart of the Impressionist ideal. Renoir was certainly influenced by Monet and worked with him in early days. And we, some of his early works is quite clearly trying to follow Monet's uh, uh, line. The Moulin de la Galette is one where he is still under the influence of Monet, where he is trying to interpret the light coming through the trees, the dappling of light, and uh, with no fixed viewpoint. And so we get a restless but exciting patterns of colour. The man with his back to us on, in the right foreground is his friend Riviere, who said of this painting that it was an exact picture of Paris at that time in this place. And the surface of the canvas is covered in these fairly small brush strokes, um, broken up into different colours, because that was how he saw the light. And you don't see a lot of black. The black is mostly blue. A lot of it is blue. And he has different colours in with the black, as he does with all the other colours. The blue is never pure blue. It's a lot of different blues altogether. His interest in people comes through. Uh, partly because there are so many of them, you can tell he's interested, but there are glances. Riviere, for example, is engaged in a very serious conversation with two young women to his left, and they're looking at each other. To the right of Riviere, there is a man who's watching Riviere, and to his right, there is a man who is watching the young women. And in the middle of the picture, there's another young girl, probably looking towards us, in fact. In this work, he is concerned with people as individuals, individual from each other, and their own particular characteristics. And that is something which began to develop, and which developed particularly uh, in, in the later years. Something of Renoir's style can be seen in the work of another great artist of the Impressionist era. This was Edgar Degas, but his approach to his work was entirely his own. Born in 1834, Degas' classical training never truly left him. Throughout his career, he attached far more importance to drawing and line than Monet, Pizarro, or Renoir. Some critics claim Degas is not, strictly speaking, an Impressionist artist. But he was very much a member of the Impressionist circle and showed work at seven of the eight Impressionist exhibitions. In a work such as The Lawn Dresses, we can see that he shared Renoir's desire to capture the impression of the instant. Like many of his contemporaries, Degas was interested in what were known as modern life subjects. Degas was interested in breaking from tradition. He was interested in subjects which related to the day-to-day -day life of people living in Paris. This is why he painted images of people at the races, why he painted images of ballerinas, women washing themselves, and why he painted images of shop interiors and domestic scenes of the Parisian bourgeoisie. Degas was interested in the idea about, of looking, of people looking at, at each other and people being looked at. In terms of Degas' style, one of his inspirations was prints from Japan, in particular 18th century Japanese prints. And one of the reasons that more radical artists were interested in art from the East was that in the East there wasn't such a hierarchy of types of painting as there was in Europe, and that neither was there a kind of division between art and craft and this was something radical painters in France and Britain were interested in. It is Degas' paintings of the Paris Ballet that represent the pinnacle of his achievement. In the early 1870s, he became preoccupied with the subject, since it provided an excellent source of subject matter to demonstrate his mastery of line and motion. He sketched from a live model in his studio, and combined poses into groupings that depicted rehearsal and performance scenes. He produced many sketches and paintings of this subject, 
and an examination of just one of these, the ballet rehearsal from 1876, amply demonstrates his aims and ideas. Degas himself was a very private person, and when he did paint women um, working or washing themselves, he puts them in their own space, which is, which is actually very nice. And sometimes he separates us from them by quite a large area, so they are even more in their private space. And in this painting, um, you see that he's not impressionist in his use of colour, as well as in his very carefully arranged composition. In this work, we see him using, as part of the composition, uh, one main thing, which is a staircase, which takes you, swirls you up and through. So you have, you're really sort of not able to move to the left, out of the picture. You're caught by it. And by moving you up, swirling you up, you are, in fact, moving around the painting. Likewise, the floorboards, you've got the, the, the floorboards indicated, which mean that your eye doesn't focus, as it would, say, on a traditional classical composition on a particular focal point in the middle, say, but it actually takes you around and through the work. You don't particularly notice the brush strokes, except, of course, in the tutus of the dancers. And here, the dancers are white with pale pink bows, nothing bright. The brightest spot in this picture is the shirt of the man in the background, top right corner. You might not even see him, who is actually the ballet master. So it's a picture of women, two distinct groups, one working, one relaxing. By the time of the last Impressionist exhibition in 1886, which once again featured Degas' work, the approach of the whole movement had become increasingly accepted by the public and by many of the critics who had originally been so scathing. By 1886, however, the unified momentum of the Impressionist movement was beginning to ebb away. Renoir doubted publicly whether the Impressionist lack of emphasis on drawing was entirely a good thing, while other artists who had shown regularly at the exhibitions began to seek answers to their own questions about art. The subtly different approach of some of these artists would eventually lead to their art being described as post-Impressionist, and the creations of four particular post-Impressionists would become amongst the best known and most valuable in the whole of Western art. From a technical point of view, one of the most innovative of these artists was Georges Seurat. It was at the eighth and last exhibition of the Impressionists in 1886 that Georges Seurat exhibited his Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Yacht. An everyday scene, like so much Impressionist art, it is immediately apparent to the viewer that Seurat's approach differs from the masters such as Renoir. His meticulous approach and his obvious love of mathematical form in art can be seen clearly in his study of The Bridge at Courbevoie, also painted in 1886. This small sketch is in preparation for his larger painting, The Island of the Grand Yacht. Seurat developed a technique which was called pointillism or divisionism. In it, the painter places very small dots of paint. There's no signature in the application of paint, no gesture, as it were. It's an impersonal way of painting. Divisionism also took advantage of recent experiments in color. What he did was place a dot of yellow next to a dot of blue. When seen from a distance, the idea was that the yellow and the blue would mix together to create the optical sensation of the color green. While, in fact, this worked better in theory than in practice, the overall effect was astounding. The painting is made up of a series of impersonal small dots, and yet out of this arises the most tremendous atmospheric effect of rich, luminous color. But it is perhaps a canvas called Bathing at Asnier that best epitomizes Seurat's unique ability. It is better known by its shortened title, The Bathers. Clearly, this was not something which was spontaneous. Monet had talked about instantaneity. Well, this was something which, by the whole process of working and thinking of, of Seurat, couldn't actually happen. 
he was trying to take the external world, the contemporary world again, the ordinary, the contemporary and the ordinary, ordinary Parisians going out in their lunch hour to sit on, uh, in the park. But he was then drawing upon that and then in the studio working on developing up a highly complicated structure. In the bathers, we have, it, we have still extant um, studies in which there were no figures at all. He's just done that scene, that park. Then he applied, in another study, some figures and worked around with these. They became, the figures, became no more and no less important than every other bit of the work. Now you can see that in the bridge. The bridge at Courbevoie is, um, is one view of the River Seine, which he um, did in 83 to 4. And it's um, constructed of very clear horizontals and verticals. And you can see quite clearly his use of this small brush stroke. And in the bathers, you'll see that his colour has lightened up and purified considerably, much clearer, brighter colours. The horizontals here are much less dominant. In fact, the concentration is mainly on the figures. And the figures provide the vertical emphases of the picture. And the colour is primarily the blue and the green, broken down, of course, in each case. And there is a certain um, diagonality about it as well, as there is in the previous one. Only here, the emphasis is much, much more on people. It's a more human painting than the bridge. In Surratt's work, the apparent lack of form of earlier Impressionist paintings was replaced by a severe regularity, and this intellectual approach can be seen as a major break from tradition, while his concern with colour would be shared by another artist who would be eventually labelled a post-Impressionist too, Paul Cezanne. Born in 1839, Cezanne's artistic development, like Seurat's, was greatly influenced by Impressionism. In 1872, he worked with Pizarro, learning the Impressionist approach to open-air painting, and Cezanne's work would feature in the early Impressionist exhibitions. Unfortunately, critical reaction to his work proved especially vitriolic. Disillusioned, he retreated to his hometown of Aix-en-Provence, where he could pursue his artistic development undisturbed by the critics. As a man of private means, he did not have to rely on buyers for his work and could dedicate himself solely to his quest for artistic perfection. Although Cezanne had initially accepted the Impressionist theories of colour and the use of everyday life as subject matter, he became frustrated with the Impressionist lack of form and structure. To this end, Cezanne made landscape paintings and still life pictures, which used a new theory of colour he increasingly believed in the representation of nature purely through colour patterns. He believed that colour is all we see and that colour should fulfil the traditional role of light and shade in giving depth and solidity to the subjects he painted. He did not want to return to the academic conventions of drawing and shading and instead used strong, intense colours laid out in an even grid to bring attention to his pictures between flatness and depth. If he had to distort outlines to achieve the desired effect, then he would. This technique heavily influenced the later Cubist movement. In his quest for representing nature purely in patterns of color, Cezanne worked unceasingly for many years. Like Seurat, he was a rationalist in his approach to his problems. His greatest challenge was to apply his theories to landscape painting, where he could not use the snapshot approach of the Impressionists. Instead, he spent days, months, and even years experimenting with the subject or motif, as he called it, until he had observed the colors for long enough for him to translate them onto canvas. One such motif was the mountain of Mont Saint-Victoire, near his home. He painted it often, and it gives us a great impression of his use of colour 
to provide solidity in the subjects he portrayed. In this particular study of Mont Saint Victoire, we can see if we look towards the centre there, right centre, we get the edge of a building which shows this vertical with the contrast of light and dark. And of course, there's the, the horizontal underneath, which gives that strength. And it's the hobbies of the strength which the Zen is getting. But we also see, as we look through the, if you like, the planes, the contrast of the planes, we see the little bridge towards the back, towards the rear, which, because of its size in relation to that building at the, you know, gives again the impression of depth, but without any of the traditional techniques. Moved. And then, because of colour receding, advancing, uh, we have, with the subtle relationship of that with the, with the mountain at the back and the sky around it, we are, if you like, taken into solid depth, but in a totally different way than, say, a constable or a Claude or whatever. He's using the directional brushstroke in a different way from the other impressionists. His brushstrokes are very, very organised, so that you get a kind of grid over the whole painting and you get a sense of great solidity. For example, the trees in the bottom are painted with brush strokes which go up, uh, so they're flame-like trees. The mountain has sloping brush strokes to show the contours of the mountain, whereas on the fields you can see flat brush strokes showing how vertical they are. His colours are not bright Impressionist colours, they are this particular green that he uses a lot, Viridian green, pale yellows, pale oranges and the pale blue of the sky. So he, like Degas, in fact, is interested in composition and structure, not just in the patterning on the surface of the painting, and not especially interested perhaps in light, certainly not in the same way that Renoir was. Another artist specifically concerned with colour was Paul Gauguin. Born in 1848, Gauguin began his artistic career as an amateur while he worked in a stockbroker's firm. In his youth, Gauguin was a rather unhappy but wealthy businessman. Later on, when he took up painting full time, he made his greatest contribution to his tremendous interest in primitive art. He found Egyptian art, South Sea Island art, to be tremendously powerful in its formal achievements. As a post-impressionist, or as Gauguin called it, a symbolist, he led a group of painters who were trying to reinvigorate Western painting with the primary power of primitive painting. Gauguin felt that modern industrialized society, as he experienced it in the late 1800s, had distorted man's essential needs. It had taught man to appreciate nothing but the material aspects of life, leaving behind all emotional and spiritual needs. This quest for the spiritual life in painting took him on many journeys. First it took him to Brittany, in the rough, unspoiled countryside there, and then to southern France, where he worked with other painters such as Van Gogh. Finally, it took Gauguin to the furthest ends of the earth, to the South Seas and to Tahiti. He was influenced by what he would have understood as to be the primitive qualities of these types of foreign peoples. His paintings was starting to demonstrate an interest in the workings of the unconscious, an interest in the language of dreams and visions. And this was something that Western artists such as Gauguin believed to be particularly strong in more primitive cultures. His images, such as Jacob wrestling with an angel, seem to have this abstract quality to them with an emphasis on simplicity and almost a deliberate attempt to appear childlike because to be childlike was something which artists who were interested in primitivism believed to be a very important quality and which they believed manifested a type of truth which had been lost in Western culture, but which was far more prevalent in the culture of the South Seas. In addition to his own significance as one of the finest representatives of the post-impressionist movement, Gauguin is also important as one of the very few people to appreciate at this time the art of another great post-impressionist, an isolated, tortured man from Holland, 
an artist without whom any reference to post-impressionism is incomplete. Vincent van Gogh. Vincent van Gogh is now generally considered as the greatest Dutch painter since Rembrandt. But during his tragic life, cut short by suicide at the age of 37, his genius was known to barely a handful of people, Gauguin included. The now familiar tale of Vincent's life remains perhaps the classic example of an artist, utterly ignored in life, but revered by posterity. Van Gogh's greatest works were produced in the two years prior to his 1890 death. He worked at Arles in the south of France. Vincent had learnt of the Impressionist methods and the techniques employed by Seurat, and liked to paint in dots and strokes of pure colour. Van Gogh seems to have taken the Impressionist interest in a variety of obvious brushstrokes to new limits. His brushstrokes seem to create the body of his paintings. He also seems to have been influenced by the Impressionist's desire to depict modernity, to depict modern life, which enabled people with no academic training to respond to and engage with his paintings. Van Gogh's paintings seem to be characterised by the, their extremely vivid colours. And this can partly be explained by the way in which Van Gogh would paint directly from the tube. He wasn't concerned with softening his colours in any way. He was interested in these new pigments. It was in this period that new developments in science and, and manufacture allowed these extremely powerful pigments to be produced. So maybe by using these pigments in their pure form, Van Gogh was able to make a further statement about modern life. In his famous letters to his brother Theo, Van Gogh referred to his powers to create and talked of using colors to express himself. He experimented with new colors and distorted forms in order to portray his emotions on the canvas. This was Van Gogh's point of departure from his contemporaries, with the possible exception of Gauguin. He no longer wanted to paint representations of the visual world, but to paint this world as a means of expressing what he felt. In pictures such as Starry Night, his priority was not the subject matter. He wanted to convey emotion and a sense of turbulent mood to the viewer. He describes one of his pictures, of his lodgings at Arles, as something that should portray a restful feeling. To look at the painting, he said, ought to rest the brain or rather, the imagination. He had all these bright ideas, enthusiastic bright ideas, and one of them was in 1888 to uh, go to the south of France and to um, set up an artist colony. Uh, and he invited Gauguin uh, to be the leader of this artist colony. And uh, he then went through a whole series of preparing for this to happen. One of the bits of preparation which Van Gogh did was to prepare a painting to send or to be there when Gauguin came, which was to welcome. And it was the bedroom at Arles. And uh, if we have a look at it, we see that there are, well, for one thing, there are two chairs and there are two pillows and there's, there's almost two of everything, which is, again, a welcoming sign. But the use of yellow is very predominant there. The chairs are yellow. But also the welcoming of, of red, the red coverlet. So this is not colour which was there. It is colour which Vincent is using in the painting. So there's no, no guarantee that those things were that colour in that painting. What he presents to us, what he's presenting to Gauguin initially, uh, is, as he says, uh, a place of thought and peace. He's welcoming. And if you look at this painting, you can't actually get into the work. There's a great barrier, the end of the bed. And everything prevents you from actually coming in. You can look and enjoy, but Vincent doesn't want you to actually come into it. So we've got his own personal problems, the personal relationships uh, coming in there. He wanted this painting 
funnily enough, to give a feeling of sleep. Well, I don't think it does. It's, the floor appears to slope at a rather dramatic angle and the colours are very, very bright, not at all sleepy. He uses, he loved the colours. He uses colours inside that he would use outside, bright yellows, um, orange blues, wonderful vibrant colours. And he believed that our everyday objects were very important. And this, of course, links him also to the impressionist that the everyday world of the present is worth painting. In his last years, Van Gogh produced a prodigious quantity despite his frequent bouts of depression. It was during one such bout that he attacked with a razor Paul Gauguin, his great admirer who had come to stay with him in Provence. Filled with remorse that night, Van Gogh cut off his own ear and shortly afterwards painted the consequences in his famous self-portrait with bandaged ear. In the few lucid moments he had left, Van Gogh produced some of his most famous pictures, many depicting the simplest of subject matters. His wheat field with cypresses and his famous sunflowers are just two of the timeless works created by a man whose time was quickly running out. He eventually shot himself on the 27th of July, 1890, having lived his life in poverty, utterly unaware of the acclaim he would eventually receive in the following century. More so than any of the great artists of Impressionism or Post-Impressionism, Vincent van Gogh paid the ultimate price for commitment the commitment to innovative experimentation and to delving the depths of perceptual experience characterized the work of the great Impressionists. The post-Impressionists bequeathed to modernism their passionate love of primitive art, their intense emotional commitment, and their increasingly flat abstract surfaces. It was an age that gave us some of the true landmarks in Western art.